so you, you know you're getting old when uh, middle-aged people start to call you sir. <laughs> and, and that's been happening to me the last couple of years. And so uh, it, it, as a result, you know, uh, both for that reason and because uh, uh, Buffalo h has such a special place in my own life, uh, I decided to make this talk be a little bit more personal uh, than, uh, than scientific. So uh, yes, I will go through some of the science of nutrition uh, and cancer, but I'm going to do it really through a personal uh, uh, lens and uh, give you some perspective uh, that comes from an old guy uh, who's been plowing through these uh, fields for, uh, for 40 years. So where does it start? It starts with an argument that I had with my wife in a car driving through Indiana, which is where we're both from, in 1975. And at that time, uh, I was a general practitioner uh, taking care of sick people. And uh, the argument went something like this. Uh, she thought nutrition was really important. Uh, and she thought uh, that uh, our children uh, should eat very specially, uh, be very careful uh, uh, about the foods they eat and the balance and making sure that, that, that they're healthy because of, of nutrition. And uh, I said, look at that corn. It, this corn can grow in a wide range of soils. They throw cow shit on the corn, <laughs> and, and, and it ends up being healthy. I, and, 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 and the argument was, I was saying that there's a wide range of foods, including brownies. I just had a couple of them. If you're hungry, they're pretty good. There's a wide range of foods uh, that, that we can eat as omnivores, and we don't have to worry too much about making sure that our nutrition is just right according to how we've read it in magazines or the latest book or whatever. Okay, that, so that's how it started for me. Why did I, why in, 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 in that time uh, did, did we think nutrition uh, was important? Well, around that era in the late 70s, uh, this was the extent of our knowledge about nutrition and health. And so in part because of the argument, uh, I began paying a little bit more attention uh, to nutrition. And uh, in fact, there were some pretty compelling stories back in the 70s about how strong uh, the relationship might be between things like, for instance, dietary fat uh, uh, in the diet and, and uh, cancer risk from uh, ecological studies or from migration studies that indicated when people move from uh, low incidence cancer countries to high incidence cancer countries, they acquire the risk of their new country within the first generation or two, meaning it's not genetic. Uh, there's something else uh, in the life experience that largely drives uh, uh, cancers. Or at the time, rodent studies that indicated if you uh, throw high fat foods uh, at uh, mice or rats, they're more likely to have mammary uh, uh, cancers than not. So that began to look a little bit more uh, uh, interesting. And then uh, Dahl and Pito came out with their famous estimates. They, they did the same kind of ecological thought experiment and said cancer varies across different countries. And what else varies across different countries? Tobacco use, uh, 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 diet, uh, physical activity, uh, virus infections, environmental chemicals, and they did some really back of the envelope sort of crude calculations saying that, well, maybe tobacco causes a theory of all cancers and nutritional factors together uh, cause uh, another third. Well, late 70s, uh, early 80s was when uh, uh, then there was really, in, in my view, beginning to be some extraordinary promise that uh, if, if, in fact, we studied these things better, uh, we might, in fact, find really some, some strong uh, dietary factors. And that's when I got a question from a four-year-old. 
Now, those are the hardest questions to answer if you take them seriously. So my four-year-old at the time, I was doing a preventive medicine residency in Michigan. Uh, I had been in general practice for about five years and uh, decided to go back and learn about prevention and, and what people might do in their lives to reduce uh, disease risk. And part of my reason for doing that, instead of the emergency medicine residency that I otherwise was inclined to do, because I also like acute emergency things, and I like to work with my hands, uh, was the, the, the questions I got from my patients. And the questions I was getting from my patients that were the hardest ones to answer were the ones that were coming out of Prevention Magazine. And they were all, all coming in with the latest issue. What, what, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, do, do cantaloupes really prevent brain cancer? Or whatever the, the latest thing was. And I'd say, I don't know. I don't know. But because there was all this background preliminary idea that, that dietary effects might be really strong, I thought, well, maybe I really needed to learn about it. So I did a preventive medicine residency intending to go back into practice. That was my plan until I got this question from my four-year-old son. He, he was going to nursery school, and I was going to graduate school. He knew I was in school. I knew he was in school. When he came home at the end of the day, I asked him what he learned. So he'd tell me what he learned about colors or numbers or whatever. But one day he asked me, what did you learn? I said, well, what, what I learned is I learned how uh, people can stay healthy. I thought that was the end of it. How? <laughs> well, uh, you, you eat, re eat really healthy foods. That's important. And never smoke tobacco. That's really important. And get good sleep and, and get good rest. That's important. And he said, what else? And I said, well, that, that, that's all we really know for sure. <laughs> he said, but you go to school every day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I decided to go into research instead of back into practice. So that was the time that Saxon called me. And he was just new department chair, trying to recruit up his department. And uh, he said, why don't you come take a look at uh, the situation here in in Buffalo, and Buffalo was much further east than I ever thought I would ever live, but did nonetheless, and was really compelled uh, by him and Jim and, 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 and the group here and what they were doing. So uh, I moved uh, uh, to Buffalo. So the question for nutritional epidemiology, both then and now, is can we really estimate habitual diets? Do a little thought experiment here, or a little actual experiment. Think about peas in your own diet. Think about how often you eat peas, you as a person. Kind of go through that in your head. How often? Now how, in terms of a month, in a month's time, with an average of 30 days in a month, how many are pretty sure, so, so come up with a number in your head, how many days in a typical month you have a, a serving of peas? Now, there might be an occasional pea slipped into a salad or something, but a little pile of peas. How many of you are pretty sure that you eat peas five times a month or less? Five times a month or less, raise your hand. How many of you are pretty sure you eat peas 10 times a month or more, uh, ra raise your hand. OK, I'm going to take you five times the less people. How many, how many of you are pretty sure that you eat peas less than a couple times a year? OK, maybe 20% of you. OK, so we've just done food frequency on peas. And so <laughs> if, if, if we do that as well on Brussels sprouts, we'll get a distribution of answers. If we do that on, on uh, salmon, we'll get a distribution of answers. On chocolate brownies, we'll get a distribution of answers. Uh, so it w w those of you that think you eat peas somewhere between you know, 
three times a month and seven times a month, I have no idea whether three and seven are really different or whether you, just your perception's different. But those of you who eat peas ten times a month or more and never, I'm pretty sure you're properly classified. So if peas was the only thing we had to worry about, uh, estimating dietary intake would be pretty easy. Now, our colleagues who want to know down to the microgram how many peas or the pea count uh, will never have that. So uh, my first reflection, I think there's about 10 reflections here. First one is we can rank people by diet. Yes, there's error in it, and yes, we have to be careful that with our study designs that the error is not biased. That's a particular issue in intervention studies, I think, where we track things, and, and, and I think there's a stacking bias. But in observational studies correctly done, we can rank people by diet, and ranking people is good enough for epidemiology. It's not good enough for estimating what the cancer risk per microgram of peas is, but it is good enough for answering the simple question is, is there anything going on? Is there any relationship between pea consumption or broccoli or Brussels sprouts or salmon uh, or barbecued meats or alcohol or any number of things that we study in cancer epidemiology. And this is a perpetual problem. It has been for 40 years and it will continue. And I think the confusion around the um, question about whether we can estimate a diet is, is confusion around precision. Because it's clear that we cannot precisely estimate diet but it's also clear, I think, that we can, at the extremes of the distribution of, of intake of foods, we can compare people who are at high and low uh, uh, levels uh, of intake. I'm going to go through the major cancers and just give you some more reflections on what's happened in this field in the last 40 years, and, and, and then I'll close with where we're going. Starting with lung cancer, because as you know, it's a leading cause cancer death, if you sum up all the deaths from breast, prostate, uh, and colon cancer, you still don't get uh, to the number of deaths uh, uh, from lung cancer today. Well, what did we know uh, back in the 1980s about uh, lung cancer? It, it was pretty clear that fruits and vegetables, higher intakes were associated with lower risk. Part of that's confounding with tobacco, but part of it appeared not to be confounding uh, by tobacco. And in fact, circulating uh, carotenes in the blood, which come from uh, fruits uh, and vegetables, uh, could also predict uh, uh, lung cancer. Again, some of that is due to the suppression of carotene levels by smoking, but not all of it. So it, it certainly looked in the 1980s like there was something about fruits and vegetables that uh, was associated with lung cancer risk at the time Beta carotene seemed uh, perfectly safe. Hoffman LaRoche was building plants to crank up beta carotene uh, production uh, for distribution uh, in the United States. So, a reasonable question that Peter Greenwald and others at the National Cancer Institute came up with was why not go straight to randomized controlled trials? So, the alpha tocopherol beta carotene trial and the carrot trials were launched, and here was, here's the results. Uh, both for those trials as well as for uh, uh, several uh, others, uh, a trial in China for stomach cancer, a polyp uh, prevention trial, a skin cancer prevention trial, and the physician's health study. And what we found, as you know, is that when you give high-dose beta-carotene supplementation, you actually drive up lung cancer risk by about 20 percent. You don't drive it down. And that was, uh, of course, very disappointing. Uh, the, biological mechanism that explains why this nutrient that we theretofore thought was perfectly safe at, at all doses, the biological mechanism is still, I don't think, adequately explained. There's, there's some good theories about uh, retinol uh, uh, receptors and so forth, but I don't think it's adequately explained, nor has there been much attention at all to another interesting observation, and that is that coronary heart disease deaths also were elevated in these uh, trials and also in the physician's uh, uh, health study. And uh, why beta carotene would cause both more cancer and more heart disease uh, is still, I think, uh, not adequately explained, and I spe especially the heart disease 
uh, question has not uh, been uh, adequately addressed. But clearly uh, it did, it, which raised a, a question that uh, we have today, uh, repeated uh, many times hence. Is it possible that uh, vitamin pills can cause net harm? And my take on that is yes. It's proven, in fact, that vitamin pills, especially single agents taken in more than two or three times RDA levels, can and do cause harm. Go to your general nutrition store and ask the clerk what you should take to lower your cancer risk, and you'll be horrified what you hear. It's unbelievable. Uh, and then walk up and down the shelves and see, uh, you know, and then you know, what proportion of these products being sold to the American public have ever been tested in, in, in clinical trials. It's very, very, uh, very, very low. There's going to be a session at the AACR meetings in Philadelphia in a week uh, on, on nutritional supplements, and I'm going to give some comments there. My comments there are going to be more political than scientific. We're going to review this evidence that vitamin pills can and do cause harm, but I'm going to review the politics of, of uh, uh, congressional conflict of interest uh, uh, in, in this area and why we, need to, uh, why we need to fix that. So my second reflection uh, is pills aren't food. And try as we have to emulate what appears to be benefits of micronutrients as obtained in the mixture of foods that we were either created or evolved uh, to need, depending on how you believe it, uh, uh, we, we haven't been able to uh, replicate that, uh, th those effects uh, uh, in pills. So that's the lung cancer story on, on nutrition. Uh, how about colorectal uh, cancer? And now I get back to Saxon. So. Uh, when I uh, came here, Saxon had already completed his first study of cruciferous vegetables. And like, like, like many of us who study something, when we have a finding and publish a paper with our name on it, uh, we get particularly strongly uh, attached to that idea, to, the, to that finding. And I'm as guilty of that as uh, uh, anybody. But Saxon was particularly identified with the idea that cruciferous vegetables, uh, it's cruciferous because when you cut the stalks, there's a little cross uh, in the stalks of this class of uh, plants. It includes uh, many of those you see here, cabbage, uh, uh, Brussels sprouts. I guess there aren't any Brussels sprouts here. I hate Brussels sprouts. How many of you, uh, how many of you ha also hate Brussels sprouts? <laughs> they just taste nasty. There's a genetic reason. There's a genetic reason why, uh, why uh, the taste is nasty for some of us, uh, in fact. And if you look at the genetics of that uh, from northern Europe to southern Europe, you, you see the mix of foods change depending on how the genotype change, changes uh, uh, for taste. Anyhow, his, his observation, as, as you just heard, uh, he used to be a spy. And so when he came here, Abe Lilienfeld, uh, knowing he was a sociologist, said, you know, why don't you just go out and spy on people and figure out what, you know, what, what in the heck causes cancer. So he did. And one of the things he noticed was that uh, 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 Eastern European immigrants uh, in, in, in Buffalo were eating a lot of these kinds of foods when other people uh, weren't. So, so he included that on a questionnaire. So all the new patients who came into Roswell Park who weren't, weren't yet diagnosed but had cancer symptoms filled out a, a dietary questionnaire. How often do you eat peas? I don't know if peas was on there or not. But how often do you have cabbage? How often do you have broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts? That was on there. And, and in, in a case control uh, comparison, then he found that the people without colon cancer were more likely to report eating these kinds of foods more often than the people with colon cancer. Well, that was interesting. What was also interesting was at the time the referral patterns into Roswell Park were that um, people who had non-cancer conditions but symptoms that maybe could be construed as cancer like postmenopausal uh, bleeding or uh, bleeding from the stool, most of which as you know is hemorrhoids or, or, or something else, they were being seen locally by 
this cancer institution because it was also serving general medical uh, uh, purposes. Whereas uh, people with real uh, cancer were, were, were coming from a wider region. So given that there were more Eastern European immigrants here in Buffalo, uh, that's, that maybe created a stacked deck in which the non-cancer cases were more likely to be from Buffalo and the cancer cases were more likely to be from the region. So anything associated with buffaloness, such as cruciferous vegetables or chicken wings or something, might, might be seen to be protective against uh, colon cancer. Now, we didn't really piece that together until later after a bigger and better study was done. So uh, one of the things that Jim and I and Maria and others uh, worked with with Saxon was to design a better study. So instead of just a single hospital case control study, we did a population-based case control study, sending people out into the homes to do deeper interviews, having neighborhood match controls, and doing it right, uh, if you will, thinking that once we did it right, we would see a stronger relationship with cruciferous vegetables and colon cancer. And what we saw was nothing, no relationship between cruciferous vegetables uh, and cancer. Now, I'm, I'm about to criticize Saxon, but I know if he were sitting here, he would be happy to, to have me criticize Saxon because the critique I'm going to make of Saxon is the same critique that's a weakness in all of us. And that is once we believe something, it's hard to, to accept evidence uh, to the contrary. And so uh, this bigger, better, more definitive study, uh, he consternated on that for two or three years before he would publish that, trying to torture the data every which way. And then finally in the paper on diet and colon cancer that, that he, I should say we, did publish, uh, cruciferous vegetables never made it to the tables. It was only in text. Now, the cruciferous vegetables was the reason we did the study. Uh, several years later, when I chaired a group at IARC doing a review on cruciferous vegetables, uh, one of the people who was abstracting the data and, 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 and pulling the tables in, I, I looked at it and I said, well, you know, where's the Western New York uh, study? Well, they had missed it because it was only in text. It wasn't in the tables. And it wouldn't even, that big null study never would have even gotten in the review had I not uh, been aware of it. So the reason I tell that story is publication bias is an insidious problem and, 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 and it's, it has more substantial and more subtle uh, and I think more profound effects on, on biomedicine in general, especially now in the omics era. It's even, you know, squ the problem is squared in omics. But, uh, but, but, but it's there and I think we all can recognize it in our own lives. When I open a journal and I see that somebody is publishing a paper on something that I've already published on, I hold my breath. Oh God, please, don't, don't, don't make this be the wrong direction, right? How many people do that? You know, we all do that. And so we, we carry these biases in our work and how we uh, carry, how we design our work forward, what we want to see, what we don't want to see, what we want to talk about, and what we want to uh, uh, publish. And I think we need to be aware of that in ourselves um, so that we can do a better job of being scientifically objective. Well, there's lots of colorectal cancer risk factors apart from cruciferous vegetables. Um, together, if you, depending on how you sum these up, you might get to as much as 40% of the uh, preventable fraction or population attributable risk might be due to a fairly short list of, of uh, nutritional uh, uh, factors. The long view, though, is that colorectal cancer doesn't come from the colon. It comes from polyps that grow in the colon. And the nice thing about that is you can find, you can actually see these and remove them years before they further devolve and mutate into uh, colorectal cancer. Well, that opens up the possibility then that we can do trials to prevent not just colon cancer, but to prevent adenomas or polyps that grow in the colon. And the nice thing about polyp trials is that there's, there's a nice three-year window within which you can do a randomized controlled uh, either nutritional supplement uh, trial or dietary uh, intervention trial because uh, people after they have a polyp cleaned out will have another colonoscopy in three years. And that's a nice window then to do a prevention trial. And there's been probably a dozen 
polyp prevention trials uh, uh, done, uh, most of the results are null, except for actually for calcium supplementation and aspirin, uh, which reduced risk uh, mod moderately. I'm not going to go through all these, but I did want to talk about the folate uh, trial a little bit. Because folate, I think you're going to see more in the news about folate uh, in the future, uh, because uh, folate supplements may not, uh, and, and folate, uh, uh, I think folate fortification is a good idea, but folate supplements may not be a good idea. So our trial actually went for, for seven years. Uh, randomized controlled uh, a trial, about 1,000 uh, patients, and after seven years, those who took folate for seven years actually had uh, almost a two-fold uh, increased prevalence at seven years of uh, advanced polyps. By advanced, I mean large or histologically uh, advanced. These are the polyps that are closer to devolving to colon cancer than the many uh, smaller uh, uh, polyps. So we saw it was more likely to be multiple polyps, and those that were observed were more likely to be uh, uh, advanced uh, in the folic acid uh, uh, group. Once more, here we are. So we did it with beta carotene, and uh, now even folic acid that nobody thought would ever be a problem. In fact, 10 years earlier, we fortified the U.S. grain supply with folic acid, putting in twice the amount that was there before milling. When I was at CDC, I had arguments with uh, um, the uh, birth defects group about that, because we were trying to decide how much folic acid to fortify in the U.S. grain supply. Now, the trials, the rationale for it was birth defect prevention, because it's clear that high-dose folic acid uh, given before pregnancy or very early in pregnancy reduces neural tube uh, uh, defects. Uh, but those doses, if we wanted to replicate them by fortifying the U.S. grain supply, would have meant putting 100 times the amount of folic acid in, in grains that was ever there. And so the debate was how much. And, and the birth defects people wanted to go to those high levels, or at least 20 or 30 times. Uh, and uh, some of us were more conservative, saying, you know, you, you can actually do harm here, and, and doing a big experiment on the U.S. population uh, is probably not, uh, not a good idea. So we settled on two times fortification. Uh, birth defects did come down. Uh, it turns out, I think, that a lot of the effect of folic acid in preventing birth defects was not so dose-dependent. It was, it was correcting a deficiency. Uh, that some women had, and it wasn't a big pharmacological dose uh, uh, on, on top of that. So there's lots of ways, exercise, weight control, reducing uh, 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 red meats, chemo prevention, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like uh, uh, aspirin and calcium, uh, but we can also remove adenomas. And so this isn't actually how we remove adenomas, but uh, gets, gets the point across. You have to actually look to see if there's adenomas there. Uh, looking for occult blood in the stool uh, is fine for late stage disease, for cancers that bleed, but adenomas generally don't bleed, and so it's a bad way to, it's a bad strategy for finding the one in four of us who are going to have adenomas. And uh, so find, uh, doing endoscopic screening uh, to find and remove adenomas, I think, is, is, is the way to do it. My reflection on that is we have to do what works. So, yes, uh, we're interested in nutrition. Yes, we're interested in upstream uh, prevention. Yes, we think there's too much high-cost clinical care uh, in, in the world, including sticking tubes in people and so forth. But we have to be objective, and despite those um, prejudices that we might have, we really do need to do uh, what works. So if we can reduce risk of getting colon cancer by at least 60% through uh, a once in every decade colonoscopy, we should make sure we get that done as we're figuring out everything else about nutrients and, and obesity and physical activity and so forth. So a fair amount of my uh, uh, emphasis in the last uh, decade uh, in Colorado has been in colorectal screening and getting endoscopic uh, uh, colorectal uh, uh, screening done. And so 
even though in my career I feel like I've made little contributions here and there. I, I don't feel like I've made any sort of breakthrough finding, uh, but I feel like I've made little contributions uh, to the field, both through research and teaching. Uh, uh, what I feel best about are the uh, 18,000 people we've given free colonoscopies to uh, in Colorado, having found uh, uh, and removed adenomas in uh, almost 5,000 uh, of those people. I'm also involved with the World Cancer Research Fund in this uh, uh, effort, published now uh, uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, in which we did a big meta-analysis of the world's literature uh, looking at uh, nutritional factors uh, around the world. And the World Cancer Research Fund concluded both then and with continuing updates of that uh, review, which they published periodically uh, by continuing to update the meta-analyses, that uh, obesity is a major contributor to uh, many of the most common uh, uh, cancers uh, in both developing and undeveloped uh, uh, countries. And the estimates of the uh, preventable fraction or the uh, population attributable risk uh, are not trivial uh, for these. Look at endometrial cancer. The estimated about half of all endometrial cancer uh, in the U.S. is caused uh, uh, by obesity, about a third of esophageal cancer and so forth. So these are, are pretty big numbers. Uh, I was on another of these uh, IARC uh, work groups chaired by Walt Willett. Uh, and um, at that time, uh, we were, we were summarizing the evidence for uh, obesity and physical activity as contributing to cancer risk and concluding uh, with our back of the envelope estimates that maybe 15 to 20 percent of uh, all cancers were caused by obesity and or lack of physical activity or those two uh, working uh, synergistically together. And I remember an exchange I had with Walt. So Walt was chairing the meeting. Uh, it was in, in a big room. We had people from all around the world there, maybe 30 uh, people doing this uh, uh, review. And at, near the close of our week's uh, process, he wanted to write into the report that uh, obesity was the most important nutritional risk factor for cancer. And I didn't want that because I said, well, I'm still not convinced that uh, given given our uncertainty about dietary measures, our uncertainty about physical activity measures, that obesity is not just the easiest to measure indicator of other things that collectively are, are, are more important. So I was uncomfortable with that. So we did put this estimate in there, uh, but I don't think the report ever said that obesity was uh, number one. I had the same argument with Larry Garfinkel. Now, Larry Garfinkel was a very gifted statistician from the American Cancer Society when they had their offices in New York. Uh, and Larry uh, was very excited by what the insurance actuaries were doing uh, about obesity and their actuarial estimates of, 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 of life ex extension or, or, or length of life. Uh, for, for the in life insurance betting uh, system that we have, uh, with, which is insurance. And, and they noticed, of course, that the, if you're obese, you don't live as long. And so uh, Larry was interested in that kind of analysis, and he extended that to uh, a large cohort that the American Cancer Society had assembled using volunteers from around the country. So uh, various offices uh, around the country were told, you find 10,000 people. And then they got volunteers who went out and knocked on doors. And it was a very cost efficient way to make a cohort of a million people. Today, doing it with our current methods, this would be tens of millions of dollars. And I don't know what the ACS spent on it, but I'd be surprised if they spent even a million uh, dollars because they used all volunteers. And then the volunteers got people to fill out questionnaires, and the questionnaires included things about tobacco and, uh, uh, and, and family history and height and weight. So his analysis indicated, uh, and he began to publish these in, uh, uh, in mostly in the 80s and early 90s, his analyses indicated that obesity was a major cancer risk factor for many different cancers. 
not just the ones that we thought it might be, like for, for colon and, and so forth. And my argument with Larry was similar to my argument with Walt. I said, th this is fine, but I think that obesity might just be the easy to measure indicator of, of a set of other factors. And when we, when we measure those better, dietary factors, physical activity factors, what we'll find is that they overshadow uh, obesity. My next reflection is that both Larry and Walt were right about uh, obesity. Yes, there's other factors that contribute to them. And so to some extent, obesity is blamed for low quality of diet and, 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 and physical sedentariness and so forth. But I, I, I've now come to really see obesity as clear in, in a way the most important of all the nutritional risk factors uh, for cancer and probably for heart disease and certainly for diabetes uh, as well. It does affect cancer at many sites. It affects both genders. It is preventable and it is modifiable. I'm not, I'm not just waving my hands and saying it, e it is easy, but we have empirical evidence that obesity is preventable, that it's modifiable, and it certainly contributes to a lot of cancers. My next reflection uh, ties back to Saxon is 1983 in Paris. Saxon was invited to go give a talk at uh, a symposium uh, on breast cancer in Paris that was being led by Dr. Tony Miller from Toronto. Now, at that time, uh, our group had published uh, a case control study saying dietary fats were unassociated with breast cancer. Tony Miller had published a case control study saying dietary fats were positively associated with breast cancer. And there was a growing movement to create big intervention trials, which we have su subsequently gone through, both in Canada and the US, to reduce dietary fat intake to, br to prevent uh, breast cancer risk. Well, Saxon either didn't want to go or couldn't go, so he asked me if I wanted to go. I'd never been to pra Paris, so I said, sure. So I went to uh, uh, Paris and, and shared uh, uh, my thoughts and our thoughts uh, at the time uh, which included a new analysis I had just done with the National Health and Nutrition Examination follow-up study. The NHANES studies use 24-hour recalls, which are worthless for characterizing a person's typical diet. You need multiple recalls. But if you look at the group of people who did not get breast cancer later and the group of people who did get breast can cancer later, you can at least report on their central tendencies. Is there any indication of any relationship with dietary fat intake and breast cancer risk? And there wasn't. And I presented our studies and that and some other rationale why, uh, why it looked uh, to me like this correlation with dietary fat and the animal studies uh, with dietary fat were maybe giving us the wrong uh, uh, answer. And I remember at, at the close of that session, uh, when usually the, the presenters in the chair come together and sort of shake hands and are all collegial and everybody's thanking each other. I mean, he, he couldn't talk to me. I mean, he was, he was so ticked. Uh, he said, you should know better, and he stomped off, and that, and that, and that was, that was uh, uh, it. I mean, subsequently, we have worked together a little bit, but I've never, never forgotten about how, how deeply rooted his anger was that I would express uh, this view that dietary fats maybe don't cause breast cancer uh, uh, in women. Subsequently, as you know, there have been huge pooled analyses and two large randomized controlled trials that indicate that there's no signal there at all. Here's the four different kinds of dietary fat. I didn't even label them. It doesn't matter. None of them are related to breast cancer risk in large pooled cohort uh, analyses two large randomized controlled trials were null, including the Women's Health Initiative, which had been sort of pointed to as maybe indicating a modest risk reduction of 8%, uh, but with follow-up, now the follow-up is 8% higher. And so, you know, there's really cl clearly uh, no signal there at all for dietary fat uh, and, and breast cancer. So when we revisit the animal models, we say, well, how could it be that if you feed fat to 
uh, mice and rats, you get higher mammary cancer, but it doesn't appear to be relevant in women. So they redid those studies using isocaloric diets. The problem was when you feed fat to rats and mice, they, you know, they like to eat. They'll eat all day, and they get fat. But if you, if you feed a high percent of calories from fat to rats and mice and keep it isocaloric so they don't get fat, then it doesn't have the same effect. So it's the fat we carry. It's not the fat uh, we eat. So my reflections are I was right, uh, and rodents are not uh, people. Well, there's a lot of breast cancer risk factors. As you know, uh, a lot of breast cancer can be explained, including nutritional uh, factors. And here's the list. It's fairly uh, extensive. Uh, obesity uh, causes postmenopausal breast cancer, maybe 20% of it. Uh, alcohol causes uh, 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 breast cancer. And height is associated with breast cancer. Now, if you're short, doesn't mean you can skip your mammograms. but uh, taller women ha are at higher risk uh, uh, than uh, shorter uh, women, pointing, I think, to uh, a strong signal that there are early life nutritional factors that drive chronic diseases. We see the same thing for other chronic diseases as well. Interestingly, for heart disease, the relationship's the other way around. Being short is a predictor for heart disease, not being tall. So really fascinating clues we don't know epidemiologically how to study it, but one of my uh, recommendations at the close here is that we need to take life course epidemiology a little bit more uh, physically, or, or a little bit more uh, seriously. So physical activities are also associated with lower risk, and the total population attributable risk, again, is around 40% for these uh, uh, factors um, uh, uh, summed up uh, uh, properly. We don't know for sure what the mechanisms are, but we think estrogens mediate most of the mechanisms. Uh, it's quite likely that there are other inflammatory uh, effects as well. I just wanted to show you the alcohol data. The dotted uh, uh, lines here are for, um, let's see, those are the breast cancer uh, lines. So the, the dotted lines are from two cohort studies indicating uh, higher risk for breast cancer at one to two drinks a day even. Uh, 20 to 30 percent higher risk for women. Well, why don't we hear more about women shouldn't drink alcohol? Well, it's because of the solid lines. The solid lines here are total mortality from the exact same uh, cohorts in which at those same levels that drive breast cancer, total mortality is reduced because of what we know are profound effects of alcohol on reducing cardiovascular mortality at modest levels of intake. And it's not just the red wine, it's any alcohol. This is an alcohol, an ETOH effect, not a resveratrol or something uh, uh, effect. So I think that's interesting. I wanted to just highlight that because uh, this is a, a rare example of where a risk factor for cancer uh, plays out differently uh, for heart disease. Typically, uh, everything lines up, with a few exceptions, and that being one. And so my reflection number seven is cancer is not the only problem. So as we uh, uh, think about messaging uh, uh, for cancer, especially for a particular cancer site, we've got to put ourselves in the perspective of the people who hear that message, the general public, who may be more concerned about stroke or heart disease or Alzheimer's disease or whatever. And we have to make sure, even though we're cancer-centric, that our messages aren't too uh, cancer-centric. Uh, and this is a plug for an AACR symposium on Sunday. Uh, not this Sunday, but a week from Sunday in Philadelphia. I'm going to be chairing a, a session on this very topic of, of heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and cancer, comparing and contrasting the risk factors uh, for those diseases to try to better enlighten us about how we can cross-disciplinary, in a cross-disciplinary way, uh, in, in better inform our thinking about the real mechanisms for disease. We've become so specialized. Over the past 40 years, it's been a, a, a sea change. I mean, back in the early 1980s, we were all reading literature of, uh, all over the place. And now we're, we're, we're specialized not only in our risk factor or in our cancer, but the subtype of the risk factor or the subtype of the cancer. And we're not reading enough, we're not conversing enough uh, in the cardiovascular area, they're, they're looking at some cytokines 
as related to cardiovascular disease risk. And in cancer, we're looking at other cytokines as related to cancer risk. And as far as I can tell, it's just almost like random chance about which cytokines we began to look at first. And so we need, to, we need more uh, uh, um, cross-disciplinary uh, thinking, I think. So body mass index in breast cancer, I mean, clearly premenopausally on the left, uh, it's associated with lower risk. Postmenopausally on the right, it's associated with, uh, with, with higher risk. I'm not going to get into much of the premenopausal story, although I think it's interesting. I think there's some good ideas as to why that is. Postmenopausally, uh, not only is risk of getting breast cancer higher uh, if you're overweight or obese, but after you have breast cancer, the, your obesity at the time of your diagnosis or the time that you finish treatment which for most women is actually worse, because during treatment, women actually gain weight. They don't lose uh, weight. And the weight they gain is fat, uh, and they lose lean mass during, uh, during treatment. Uh, BMI predicts recurrence uh, better than many adjuvant treatments uh, predict uh, uh, recurrence. So it's a, it's a strong effect shown here. The interesting thing is BMI predicts recurrence even premenopausally, where I just showed you actually being overweight reduces risk of getting breast cancer, but if, you're, if you are overweight when you get breast cancer, you have a worse prognosis. And it predicts recurrence for ER negative disease and for women on antiestrogens. So we think that estrogens are the reason why obesity increases risk of getting breast cancer postmenopausally. Women who are overweight have higher levels of circulating estrogens. Overweight only predicts the estrogen receptor positive form of breast cancer. But obesity as an adverse prognostic factor seems to be working by a whole different mechanism. Now, I never would have dreamed up that, but that's what the evidence says. And so what is that mechanism? Is it cytokines? Is it some other hormonal effects that we haven't yet measured uh, we don't uh, really know, but it's a profound and important issue because more than half of women now uh, coming out of treatment for their first treatment of breast cancer are overweight or obese uh, in the United States. There's a little bit of glimmering of, of evidence that weight loss might actually be a good thing for breast cancer. Uh, bariatric surgery studies, uh, 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 not much of an effect on cancer in men but a substantial reduction, including breast cancer uh, uh, in women. Um, here are some nutritional intervention trials, the Canadian one in the first uh, line, the Women's Health, uh, the WELL trial, the Women's Health Initiative, and the WINS trials. Uh, uh, the Women's Health Initiative was, uh, th this is just the first uh, uh, result. Subsequent results have, have, have shown that there's no uh, a decrease, but at least at the first look, right after the trial was ended, uh, there was a modest weight loss in the low fat uh, arm and a modest decrease. The WINS trial had a more substantial weight loss and a more substantial decrease. So that really raises the question, would intentional weight loss after being treated for breast cancer for the half of women who are overweight make a difference? Uh, I think it would. Uh, I think we will find eventually that even modest levels of weight loss are probably as impactful on survival and recurrence risk as adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Uh, so we need a uh, trial. So we've done a, a feasibility study called the ENERGY trial. Uh, 700 women uh, were randomized to either a group-based weight loss uh, uh, program or a control group. Uh, we got about 6% weight loss at six months and, and 3.7% uh, at two years. By the way, this 3.7 was almost exactly the same that Pam Goodwin found in a pilot for a, a weight loss trial in Toronto uh, after two years. She lost her funding after two years because the drug company that was funding the trial pulled out. We lost our funding after the Vanguard study uh, because uh, uh, the uh, NCI uh, director would not allow us to submit the full, the full proposal. So uh, Harold Barmus, uh, who has now stepped down as NCI director, developed a habit of personally making decisions on all grants that came through his institute, if you can imagine, uh, especially big grants. And so 
because our uh, trial of uh, 2,400 patients, our trial expansion to 2,400 patients to have power to look at recurrence uh, was going to cost about $20 million over the course of the, of the whole trial. It was a jumbo trial that had to get his approval. We had two division directors. We had the HMO research network uh, that were all behind it, and he said no. Um, uh, we now have a new NCI director. And uh, so my reflection is you can't always get what you want. This was a major disappointment uh, to me over the last year or two that we were not able to expand this trial to prove that weight loss reduces recurrence risk. But if you try sometimes, uh, you might find a new NCI director. <laughs> so what we're going to do next is put this back together again. Now, uh, there's been too much of a delay between our 700 women vanguard and the full trial. We can't just roll them in like we'd planned to before. Uh, we'll have to start from scratch. It's going to cost more. But uh, we still think it needs to be done. So our strategy now is we're going to br bring in some new partners, uh, bring in some new uh, firepower, and uh, make the pitch to the new uh, NCI uh, director. Prostate cancer is the last one I'll talk about. There were some surprises uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, ATBC study done in uh, uh, Finland, the, the same one that showed that beta carotene causes lung cancer. Uh, they found that uh, in the uh, vitamin E arm of, of that trial, which had no effect on lung cancer, 30% reduced incidence of prostate cancer. And Larry Clark, uh, who's a friend and colleague of many of us here uh, in a skin cancer uh, trial, found that uh, selenized yeast, uh, which is essentially a whole food. You grow yeast in a broth that has extra sel selenium in it. The yeast takes up the selenium and incorporates it into the pr selenized proteins in the yeast, and then you can eat that. And it's essentially a selenized protein uh, uh, intervention. What he found was it didn't prevent skin cancer, but in fact, uh, he observed 50% reduced incidence of prostate cancer in the selenium uh, arm. Hence, uh, NCI put together the trial that I'm sure you're familiar with, SELECT, uh, which is selenium and vitamin E factorial trial, and the findings were null to adverse. It looked like in the vitamin E arm, again, vitamin E, what could be wrong with that? Uh, somewhat higher prostate uh, cancer incidence. My reflection in there, there is a chance is surprisingly likely. So the, the concern about secondary findings coming out of these trials, a lung cancer trial with a secondary finding for prostate cancer, a skin cancer trial with a secondary finding for prostate cancer. The concern, of course, is you can't take that to the bank. It, these could have been chance findings because of multiple comparisons, and or they could have been real. Uh, so I think doing select was a good idea. I'm not critical of the trial, but our reflection, I think, has to be that Sometimes chance happens, and uh, cancer, by the way, is not bad luck, uh, for those of you who might have read that paper, but chance is surprisingly likely. So back to 1975, uh, my reflection is, uh, in arguments, Diane is usually right. <laughs> Only when she feels strong enough to argue she's, is she usually right. So does it matter what we eat? Yes, it, do, it does matter. Uh, and, and, but why has there been what I characterize as slow progress? Well, first of all, I'll emphasize slow progress is not no progress. But there has been slow progress. Why so slow? Well, there's a lot of nutritional factors. Nutrition's not a single thing. It's not an HPV virus. It's not tobacco, which, Gary, is very simple, right? It, you know, so it's, it's not a single uh, uh, thing. It, it, it's a complex thing. And there are a lot of different diseases, at least 200 diseases that we call uh, uh, cancer. And even within an organ site, we now know that the risk factors differ wildly depending on the molecular uh, type of cancer that, that actually develops. And there are many other interplaying risk factors. Uh, that affect how we eat and how, we, uh, uh, how overweight we become or how physically active we are or whether we take supplements and so forth. Uh, and importantly, and, and we're learning this from molecular characterization of cancers, there are lots of redundant control pathways in biology. So it's, it's a whack-a-mole problem. You hit, you hit one signaling pathway and the other ones pop up. 
you hit two of them and three more pop up. And so uh, the redundant control pathways w come as a result of the fact that we're alive. And, 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 and the, the germ line that we came from that was not redundant enough uh, dropped off six centuries ago. And we're the result now of an omnivoric evolution. So, Diane, I was sort of right. <laughs> we are omnivores, and there's a lot of play uh, in our diets and in, 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 in our behaviors. But having said that, nutrition uh, is important. So when I go back to the question from my four-year-old, what, what do you learn in school? Uh, this is uh, his four-year-old. So on the left is my four-year-old, and on the right is his four-year-old. And he's talking to him about something there uh, as, as well. But we know a lot more today than we did uh, back then. And if you just look at the World Cancer Research Foundation recommendations, these are almost identical to the American Cancer Society recommendations. And these are all evidence-based. And most of the evidence for that has been developed over the last 40 years. So I think we can feel proud that we now know with greater certainty, uh, I'm not going to read this list, but we know with greater certainty that uh, there are nutritional impacts uh, uh, on cancer and there's no need to feel uh, cynical or, or somehow defeated. Uh, I think we've come uh, a long ways. I think we do need more research. I just highlighted four ideas here. We do need to understand the reversibility of obesity effects. We know from acute studies of weight loss that estrogens drop almost immediately, cytokines drop almost immediately, and you almost get a three for one with cytokines. 5% weight loss, 15% reduction in cytokines. So there's every reason to believe that there may be actually some fairly immediate, that is within a few years, effects of intentional weight loss on cancer risk. I think the best place to start is in a high-risk group like women after they've been treated for breast cancer, which is why we're going to continue to hammer on getting that trial done. I think we need to understand mechanisms in, in order to find ways apart from weight loss or in addition to weight loss to unlink obesity and cancer. So if these effects are being mediated by cytokines and the hyperinflammatory state of obesity, as I suspect many of them are, then what's wrong with dislinking those with, with a drug or, 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 or with a chemopreventive uh, approach? I have no philosophical uh, problem with that. Yes, it's better not to get obese. Yes, it's better to lose weight. But if we can also find ways to unlink things, I think we should. I think we need to better understand the shared mechanisms for different diseases. Uh, what's, what's the same and different about how tobacco affects uh, not only cancer, but heart disease and diabetes risk? What's the same and different about obesity's effects on things like uh, uh, kidney cancer uh, versus kidney failure uh, for other uh, mechanisms versus heart disease and stroke? I think we need to be more cross-disciplinary and figure out ways, uh, ways to do that. Uh, and then finally, I think we need to look more carefully at the life course. And, and in particular, I think we need a new generation of migrant studies. Uh, the first generation of migrant studies said that there was something about the life experience, not genetics, that makes these inter-country differences. I think the next generation needs to more carefully tease out uh, the, 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 the age at which you move, your recollection of, of behavioral differences, before and after moving, and I think people can and sh uh, can report that, and we need to invest in that. Why? Because height is related to chronic disease risk. It's related to several cancers, not only breast cancer, and that's a strong indicator now that there are intrauterine or maybe even preconception uh, uh, factors uh, uh, and, and or early childhood factors that we need to figure out how to uh, uh, better study. I don't think we can rely only on gene methylation uh, to do that. I think gene methylation is going to be a tool, but it's not going to be the answer. And I think going back to migrant studies, now that we've had different kinds of migration, not only from developing to developed countries, but reverse migration the other way, I think now is a good time to uh, invest in that kind of research. 
So this was, uh, these thoughts were fun uh, for me to put together in large part because of my recollection of Saxon. I asked him one time, I said, uh, what, what advice can you give me about uh, you know, being effective uh, in this field? And he said, read. You gotta read. And, uh, and so I've always taken that to heart. And I especially enjoy reading uh, uh, things that aren't in my uh, area. Uh, I like reading about uh, neurological disease and heart disease and, and maternal and child health and uh, international policy and, and, and things that I don't deal with because I find that that, only, that not only makes my professional life more fun, but I actually take snippets of things uh, 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 in those areas. So uh, with that, let me say uh, it's just what an honor it is to come back to Buffalo and to be invited to uh, give this lecture. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me. And the most, most pleasurable thing for me generally in giving talks is, uh, is what's about to happen now, which I hope is uh, time for some dialogue. Right? Okay. So... So let me, uh, yes? Jim, what's your view about the microbiome and obesity, chronic inflammation? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's fascinating. And I, I think we're, you know, we're so early in this that we're still trying to sort out what's going to be a blind alley from a real signal. And we're trying to sort out what's, going to, what's causal from what's just associated. But uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited about not just obesity, but also... Uh, some other associations with the microbiome, and I know several of you are looking at that here. What, what's your view on it? I don't have much of a view except what I've read. Clearly, it, the, the animal experiment suggests that uh, it make, can make a big difference in terms of obesity. Mm -hmm. When you look at the animal experiments and things like starvation, uh, uh, they sort of contradict some of the human uh, experience. Yeah, well, with, with, with humans, actually, in the historical observations that we've been able to make with starvation, it, look, it looks more similar to the animals than different. Unfortunately, we can't, you know, with, with nice brownies and things, we can't starve ourselves like we probably should. Um, but, um, I, no, I, I think the microbiome's uh, uh, exciting. I just, I just hope that we don't have a big broken bubble like we did with some of the genetics stuff over the last uh, 10 years. But I, th I, th I think it's an exciting new paradigm. I mean, most of our DNA is not ours. So if you chop up my body right now, uh, the, most of the DNA is bacteria uh, in, in, in my body. And uh, I don't know about yours, but that, that, that's mine. And, and I, so it's fascinating. Uh, those, those are metabolically active. We know that uh, if we transplant feces, uh, that can be therapeutic. Uh, for diseases that were uh, of the GI tract that were hard to cure in, uh, in the past. But we also know that we start out with a sort of a, a, a microbiome early in life, and, and it tends to be very resilient. It tends to drop back to that uh, eventually. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful that the microbiome is going uh, to help us understand not only obesity, but, but some cancer risk as well. Others, yep. Yeah, so uh, the question is, what's my view on genetically modified uh, uh, organisms? Um, I have two different views. One, one is uh, uh, about biology, and the other is about ecology. So uh, with regard to biology, I'm not worried about them. I don't want to be cavalier about it, but I don't think there's much evidence that the genetic modifications that get into our food supply is, is, hurts us in any way. Ecology, I'm more worried about it um, because of, uh, as we genetically modify uh, crops and as those crops be, take hectares and hectares uh, of land, we know that they create uh, ecological changes in other forms of life. And uh, we also could be more vulnerable to uh, particular uh, crop ha hazards of, of losing crop and losing diversity. So. The, in, in agribusiness, I'm worried about the ecology and the, and the plant diversity problems. Uh, in biology, I'm not terribly worried. What, what, what do you think? Well, I haven't thought about the ecological impact, but my impression from what I've read, uh, as informed you, is that they really don't make that 
Yeah, there's some strong feelings out there to the contrary, though, and, and there are some people who just adamantly think it's you know, terrible that we would be eating uh, a gene that wasn't, you know, wasn't there 10 years ago. Uh, but if you, if you really consider how we digest and, and break down foods and everything, it, it, that actually doesn't bother, doesn't bother me at all. Other comments or questions on either anything I touched on or, or anything else in this general area of nutrition and nutrition and cancer? Hey, Ken. Uh, great talk, really. Thank you very much. Uh, so the uh, World Cancer Research Fund actually said eat less meat. And um, my read of the history of the dietary guidelines and the government, government commission and such is that the industry really doesn't like it when any guideline says eat less, especially yeah. of their food. Yeah, they don't. Did you get any push? So did you get pushback from the meat industry? Yeah. Yeah, one of my first uh, uh, invitations uh, after this report came out was from, was from the uh, Cattlemen's Association <laughs> and their annual meeting in Reno. So, you know, I went in there with my cowboy hat on. And uh, it turned out that the uh, session in front of the Cattlemen's Association in Reno was a setup. They had hired uh, an epidemiologist uh, for hire out of a private consulting company to do his own meta-analysis and his own review. And so we were put up there sort of side by side. I gave my presentation and he gave uh, his. And then I explained why his was wrong and mine was right. And I had a pretty good conversation with him. I said, look, I said, here's the problem. That if you eat more than like the size of a pack of cards of red meat a day, we, we see higher colon cancer risk, and we think we know why that is. It's because of, of cooking car carcinogens that, from the heating of the proteins. It's because of carcinogens from drip fat that end up burning and coming back onto the, edges, uh, to the, uh, to the meat. And it's because of the heme iron in the meat. Uh, the heme from the blood actually increases proliferation in the colon. So for those reasons, we think it all m makes sense. I said, but I eat more than that myself every day. Uh, I said, I've had a colonoscopy, and I know what's in my colon, and I'm less worried about it. So my choice was to just go ahead and take that uh, uh, extra risk. But I think at the same time, it is important for America to know and for the cattlemen to know that their product does increase cancer risk, and I told them that. Uh, they weren't real happy, but, that, but yeah, we got some pushback. Well, yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, if, if the whole message was eat less meat, which I put onto the slide, th that's just a synopsis of what is, in fact, a full recommendation, which is moderate consumption of no more than about the size of a pack of cigarettes uh, a day. Actually, eating cigarettes would probably be better than smoking them, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, I, I said a pack of cigarettes. I meant to say a pack of cards. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, eat. eat E eating less is not a sufficient uh, uh, recommendation, but uh, in general, if we, if we got to that level, having meat more of a, as a condiment instead of as a main part of the meal uh, would be better for, uh, better for our cancer risk. Yes? No, so uh, I think you probably heard as well as I did. What, uh, how about uh, whole, whole milk versus skim milk? Uh, and no, I, I don't think so. I think, I think the lower fat milk is probably better for our health. The issue with milk is about how it's produced. And, uh, you know, cows that are perpetually pregnant dump a lot of uh, hormones uh, uh, into their milk. So I think the, the main concern about milk, especially for kids, is uh, hormone levels in milk and whether or not those uh, pregnancy-associated uh, hormones are causing adverse uh, effects in, in, in kids. Uh, I, I think they might be, but I'm not to the point where I'm recommending against milk for kids at this point. But frankly, I think there is some uh, reason to be concerned about uh, 
uh, kids drinking a, a lot of uh, milk because of the hormonal effects. There's been concern about premature uh, sexual development in young girls uh, t tied to milk consumption. Yeah. So the question is about cross-disciplinary work, and, and you're kind of looking for some, maybe some specific tips on how to do that, or effective ways to do that? Yeah, I'm really concerned about it, because you know, if we look at, um, uh, if we look at the uh, situation now compared to, let's say, 40 uh, years ago, it, it, it was fairly easy 40 years ago to be cross-disciplinary because things were simpler. I mean, we didn't know as much. There were, there, we didn't, our, our research enterprise, our body of knowledge uh, uh, wasn't as great. And so the drive towards specialization is really a, a strong drive uh, uh, right now. Um, and it's hard uh, to keep up. Um, I, w I was in an office recently and and uh, noticed uh, some unread journals. I said, gee, you, you've been busy. And, and, and but that's the way we all are. Uh, we're all uh, too busy. But I think, I think we, have to, we have to make time to read outside of our field. We have to make time to have that water cooler conversation with somebody working on a disease that you'll never publish on. And just, you know, wh what, what's exciting? What are you finding? And you might be surprised that, oh, it's uh, microbiomics. Oh, really? Microbiomics and neurological disease? I had no idea. Well, how are you approaching that? How are you studying it? Because I'm studying it too. Um, we, we become siloed to the point where um, the, we're missing, I think, potentials for cross-fertilization of, of new ideas. And uh, so back to tips for how to do it. Uh, I think the only way to do it is just to have those conversations. Now, I've been lucky uh, in part because I teach medical students. And so one of the ways I teach medical students is I teach right out of the current medical literature. So I have to be reading the current medical literature every week, which, which for me is a pleasure because otherwise I wouldn't have done that. And so I'm reading trials and diseases and infections and stuff that I, I otherwise wouldn't stumble across. So I think everybody's going to have to find their own way to do it, their own friend, their own colleague, their own reading habit. But uh, I, I think, I think we're, we're too specialized. I don't see any general trend away from that now, but I, but I think we need to figure out how to, how to turn that around. Yeah. Uh, health from that. I'm wondering, you know, how that relates to colon cancer. Yeah, so, uh, so with cardiovascular, the question is about aspirin. With cardiovascular disease, we're pretty sure we know what the mechanism is. Reduces clotting, and the clotting is that last event that happens in a damaged uh, uh, artery. Uh, so it doesn't prevent the artery damage, but it prevents the last, uh, the last uh, event. And the reason we don't uh, recommend it for heart disease or for heart attack prevention in people who are lower risk is because it comes with its own risks. Uh, because of the anti-clotting effects, it, it, the, the risk of bleeding out in your brain goes up. The risk of bleeding out in your GI tract goes up. Now those risks are pretty fixed regardless of your cardiovascular risk. Uh, so if, if your cardiovascular risk is really low, then those fisk, fixed other risks tip the balance away from using it, but if your cardiovascular risk is high, the risk benefit is, is, is better. For, uh, for cancer, it's sort of the same uh, story. Um, you need to take aspirin for a long time in order to reduce colon cancer risk. Uh, I actually think that we should not recommend people take, who have had a, a, a simple small polyp 
take aspirin for that reason because those other risks uh, are there. Um, um, so uh, that, 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 that's sort of my take on it. And we've, we've done randomized controlled trials on other uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, finding that, in fact, they also reduce colon adenoma uh, risk, but they have other uh, risk profiles, other adverse risk profiles, including uh, increasing heart disease uh, deaths for, uh, for some of them. So uh, I think the risks and benefits can only be teased out in properly done randomized controlled trials, which is why it horrifies me to go to the general nutrition store and see what people are taking and being sold pur purportedly. You know, if we hadn't done these uh, trials, uh, like the beta carotene trial, where would we be today with beta carotene? I'd say a third of us would be taking beta carotene supplements, probably increasing our risk for heart disease and cancer, thinking we're decreasing our risk. So um, I think trials that come out either null or adverse are good investments, not bad investments. And for prevention, I think we shouldn't be scared away from doing bigger trials in the future. Well, uh, I mean, so, some of my ideas were still blood instruments, like uh, uh, weight loss trial for breast cancer recurrence, uh, my, my new migrant studies to try to understand the life course. Uh, so I think some of those tools still need to be applied and, and reapplied. But now that we know that uh, the etiologic factors uh, for different subtypes of cancer may differ, I think we have a new kind of study design, which is a case-case design. Uh, so uh, trying to measure by whatever methods as best we can uh, nutritional factors uh, for, for everybody that has a particular kind of cancer, knowing that there are molecular subtypes of those cancers that differ and that seem to have different etiologies gives us an ability to compare cases in, to cases, uh, never mind cases to controls. Case, con case control studies are increasingly hard to do because it's hard to get unbiased controls but it's not hard to get on biased cases, especially if they don't know what their molecular subtype is, or even if they know what their molecular subtype is, they have no clue as to why uh, uh, cruciferous vegetable intake should be different for them versus the person in the bed next door. So I think case-case designs, uh, subdividing uh, uh, cases molecularly uh, is gonna be important. I think uh, um, tumor Genetics is going to be much more important than inherited genetics uh, in, in cancer studies moving forward. Maria, you had a question? I think this is um, that's oh, come on. Your question is probably terrific. My, my <laughs> question had to do with when, since the population is aging, uh, when it really doesn't matter beyond uh, obesity and uh, physical activity, not individual yeah. Yeah, so the question is, you know, how old is too old with regard to uh, important effects on cancer risk? Well, it, it's sort of a, <coughs> it, it, it's, it, it's sort of a half full glass as well as a half empty glass. And, and the full part is that <coughs> chronic disease risk, heart disease, stroke, uh, and cancer risk <coughs> is so much higher a as we age uh, that we can probably see those effects quicker uh, if we do trials, number one. Number two, I think there's good evidence that many of these factors uh, actually have short latencies, much shorter than what we thought. So we start with tobacco and we say, okay, smoking tobacco early in life causes lung cancer and later in life. There's these decades long thing. Well, if you properly do the studies, you can see a, a fairly short, even for lung cancer, 
uh, of a few years interval where you, you actually can see an effect of cessation on, on even lung cancer risk, which is sort of the worst scenario. And then you take breast cancer, where we uh, stopped taking uh, hormone replacement therapies in mass around 2003 when the Women's Health Initiative concluded that it's actually bad for us. So uh, women around the country stopped taking it. And breast cancer risk dropped off almost immediately. And so I, I think for many uh, uh, cancer risk factors, we te have tended to overestimate the latency period. So, and so back to your question, I think there's probably likely very real benefits on uh, physical activity, weight control, uh, uh, um, and all those things that I told my four-year-old to do uh, even late in life, or maybe especially late in life which uh, for some of us is starting to get a little closer than. <laughs> yes. Y y let me know, Joe, when we want to cut this off. Can I ask about dietary supplements? So there's, of course, there are often criticized a lot for the lack of dietary supplements. And you mentioned up there in the slide that ranking people was good enough for epidemiologic studies. But of course, there's lots of people working on margin of error. Yeah, I, I, th I think we can Im improve on them in some of those ways. But I, I think um, I haven't seen very good evidence that all the calibration efforts that we've made in so far have really made any difference. So I, I, I think with dietary assessment, what we need to do is, yeah, improve, look, look for biomarkers w when they're there, um, depending on, on the study design. Uh, but also just come come to the conclusion that, uh, uh, well, when, when, when we do validations, focus at the extremes of intake and, and not worry about misclassification in the middle. Uh, is the upper quintile and the lower quintile different by how much? Uh, how much are we underestimating that difference versus overestimating it? And then be satisfied with that level of, 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 of analysis. What are your thoughts? Yeah, somebody, I guess it was Mike last night at dinner, was talking about a chip that will be implanted in our gluteus maximus to do this for us someday. So maybe so. Maybe, maybe that would be better than improving Yeah, but, but seriously, I mean, there, there may be biomonitoring devices that could monitor some aspect of, of nutrition, like, like, for instance, minute-to-minute uh, -minute insulin fluctuation, which we could then infer, here's a pattern that seems to indicate that a brownie was just consumed or, or something like that. Yeah, and, and we, I think we have to be realistic about how much precision both we can get and how much precision we really need. So cancer, here's my parting gift. Cancer in 1915 was this. Cancer in 2015 is this. And those of you who have read The Emperor's Royal Malady or saw the PBS series, 
And it's pretty interesting history. And those of you who didn't see it, I would say read the book or, or pull it up online. A very uh, interesting history of the last 40, 50 years of what's happened uh, in cancer. In the mid-1990s, the ACS set this challenge goal to cut cancer death rates in half. So it, here's the 25-year challenge year period from 1990 to 2015. And I'm going to show you what's happened for the four cancers we just covered. So if, in, if, if the 1990 death rate is, in fact, 100% of the 1990 death rate, then if we're going to cut it in half, it, it, the line would have to look like this. And this is the death rates from breast cancer in the United States. We're going to damn near make that goal this year of cutting the risk of dying from breast cancer by 50% in one generation. Half of this is earlier detection, half of this is treatment. There's huge gains to be made in the next decade from improving obesity and so forth. Colorectal cancer, same story. I'm confident we're going to get to 50% risk reduction from colorectal cancer. Most of this is reduction of risk because we are remove, finding and removing adenomas. And I think we can do even better. Prostate cancer is interesting because despite the fact that screening doesn't work, PSA works because PSA identifies recurrent disease much earlier than otherwise we would identify it, getting men into more effective treatment, turning prostate cancer into a chronic disease instead of a lethal disease. And lung cancer is two stories for two genders. Because of Virginia Slims and, and, and the whole di the shift between men and women in when we started, uh, started and stopped tobacco, uh, we're going to achieve this for men but not for women for a, a number of times or a number of years yet. So if we look at death cancer rates in the country, they peaked in 1990 for lung cancer and they've been coming down precipitously since. There's California and Kentucky. Oh my God. The leading cause of cancer death in this country, there's a two-fold difference between two of our states in the risk of dying from that disease. It's not genetic, it's policy. And I'm going to close with a strong opinion that it's time that we federalize tobacco control in the United States. It's too important to leave up to the states. The state-to-state -state variation uh, is large in not only lung cancer, but uh, heart attacks and any number of things that tobacco causes. And we need, to, we need to change this. Yes, there are states' rights. Yes, states have constitutional right to control health. But tobacco is too important, and we can no longer leave it up to politics and states uh, with, with this kind of uh, a difference. So we've accomplished a lot, lot in the last 100 years. We've begun to understand biology. We've begun to win the war on tobacco. A lot more to do there. We've discovered some useful early detection methods. We're going to have much more useful ones, I think, in the near horizon, especially blood-based DNA testing will probably replace uh, much of the cancer screening we're now doing. And we're getting some remarkable improvements in therapies, even for cancers that heretofore were lethal. Uh, we are curing some of them, or at least controlling them. Most importantly, we've begun to imagine victory over cancer, and, and that collective imagination, I think, is going to uh, drive us uh, uh, forward. So thank you for the invitation.